I guess before we do that, we should check the uh, <clears throat> diode for its uh, junction potential. So here's the diode. You can't see it, but the banded end is pointing up this way, which is the negative end. So I'm going to connect the negative lead from my voltmeter to the negative end and the positive lead to the positive end. And you'll see when I do that, I've got it set on the, at the 630 position, the, the diode setting, which is the same as a 2 kilo ohm maximum setting. This is not measuring resistance, it's measuring voltage when it's set on that scale and using the diode. So we see that uh, we have 0.637 or 8. Uh, that means this is a silicon diode. Uh, 0.6 roughly for silicon, 0.3 roughly for germanium. So we know that the junction potential is 0.6 volts roughly, and this is a silicon diode. Now let me reverse the leads and show you that it's indeed a diode, which means it only lets current go one way. So there I've reversed it so that the current's trying to go backwards through it, the, the steady one means it's off scale, there's no, nothing going on, there's no current flow. So we have a 0.64 uh, volt uh, junction potential, uh, making it a silicon diode, and there's no current going backwards through it. The resistance, uh, if you look at the other resistance scales, the resistance is over 2 million ohms. So. It's extremely high resistance, which means that with uh, the voltage we apply here, virtually no current is going through it. So it's a one-way valve. It's one-way electron valve. Current only goes one way through it. That's from uh, plus to minus in the direction of the, the band. This is the uh, setup for the uh, diodes lab. And you may uh, see that I have this set up uh, with the diode and the banded end is pointing that way towards the black wire and then we have a resistor in series with it and so we have channel 1 connected across everything and channel 2 connected across only the resistor. I have the uh, circuit hooked up uh, to the 15 volt AC uh, output and you know what that means, that means it's 44 or 45 volts uh, peak to peak uh, and uh, we saw last week with the uh, oscilloscope uh, lab, uh, that gives you a signal that's basically off scale. So let's take a look at channel one, which is basically off scale. Now, what I've done, uh, and you, you, you did this trick last time, uh, I want to look at just the top half of that to last week measure the top half. You want to remeasure the top half because you've got a different uh, transformer here. You've got a different uh, trainer, so it probably is going to have a different voltage. So this is the horrible looking sine wave that, the, that comes out of the transformer that's inside of this uh, trainer. So uh, let me uh, flip this to ground because if I move it down one uh, unit, one centimeter, I see that I can measure the top of those peaks. So again, you want to measure the, uh, the voltage here times 5 volts per centimeter. Uh, it's going to be, uh, looks like, about 4.5 centimeters. So 4.5 times 5 is roughly 23 volts. Uh, and again, uh, you need to measure the, uh, by moving this up to the line above, measure the bottom half, which is hopefully going to be about 23 volts also. So if I do this, I get about a 46 volt peak to peak, um, more or less sine wave. Okay, now what I've done also, uh, before we started uh, taping is that I put both I put both channel 1 and channel 2 signals which there's channel 1 there's channel 2 and I, I need to put those both at exactly the same height so there's channel 1 and there's channel 2 let's see uh, I need to move that up a little bit too much okay so, okay, when I go between channel one and channel two, the, the line doesn't move, so I've got them both set, uh, hopefully right on the line below that. So I can and measure carefully what's going on here because this is where the junction potential shows up. So 
Okay, so let's look back at channel one input. Uh, it's, of course, off scale towards the bottom, but we're not interested in that because we know that this is going to be a half wave rectifier, which means it's basically going to throw away the bottom half of that signal. And if I look at channel two, I'm going to put it on DC. By the way, use DC instead of AC here uh, because you get a nice flat line here. There's actually a capacitor involved in the uh, AC circuit, as we know from last week, and we don't want it to start looking at a little capacitor charge and discharge curve, so we're looking straight at it with no a capacitor in the line on DC. So uh, we, we put the, the zero volt position at the same in both cases. Here's the AC input. There's the uh, rectified pulsed DC. It's still DC. It's only going, current's only going in one direction. It's the, the positive direction, so to speak. And if we superpose those, and let's use the chop signal because it's a little more steady, uh, we see that there's a difference between the peaks, uh, and, and we know that they're both at the same reference voltage, uh, zero volts. Uh, so there's a difference in the peaks there, and that difference is the fact that uh, the total voltage drops across, across the entire system, but the, 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 there's a 0.64 volts, according to our measurements, uh, voltage uh, drop across the diode, even in the forward direction. That's called the junction potential. And so what's left here is the input voltage minus 0.64 volts. Now you can't measure 0.64 on the uh, on the screen here. We each each division is worth five uh, volts, and it's broken up into fifths. So each division uh, is two tenths of a volt. If I move this over, for instance, to the center, I can see that those two differ by uh, not quite one unit. Um, one unit here is uh, one volt, and so they differ by a fraction of a volt, ah, about six-tenths of a volt to be precise, but we can't measure it that accurately, but it's roughly several tenths of a volt. So check that out, see that the difference here is actually the junction potential. Okay, so that's experiment one. You want to measure this very carefully, make sure you get this exactly on the line and measure to the nearest probably tenth of a volt is the best you can do uh, in measuring the the peak voltage and you can see from channel two that if I move that back over again the bottom is completely cut off the the resistance of this diode is basically infinite uh, as far as we're concerned, and so there's no current whatsoever going through this backwards. Therefore, there's no voltage drop across the resistor, uh, V equals IR, which means we see no voltage at all in the negative direction, uh, and it's been nicely uh, changed into DC pulse DC from AC. Okay, now I'm going to go ahead and wire up the second circuit, figure two, and then we'll talk about that. Okay, this is the uh, figure two. Uh, the second uh, setup, this is the full wave rectification. Uh, you see that uh, we have a center tap transformer here, and when this side's positive, this side's negative below ground, and they flip around back and forth every cycle. And so uh, when this is positive relative to ground, this diode conducts, and when this is positive relative to ground, this diode conducts. And you'll notice that this is the junction where the two diodes and the resistor all come together in the same column and they're connected together and so the current either goes through this diode in this direction through the resistor and the other half of the cycle this diode conducts then and, it, and the current goes the same way through that resistor so the voltage drop is the same polarity uh, in, in both halves of the cycle and we have what's called full wave re rectification which you see on channel 2 here. So the bottoms have been flipped over up on top. So obviously this, is, this circuit is twice as efficient as the half-wave rectifier because we don't just throw away the half of the wave. We flip it over, and so we get these nice pulses in the same direction every time. Okay, so again, measure that carefully. You may see that these two, this peak and this peak, every other peak, is not exactly at the same height. I think you can even see that here. This peak is a little bit lower than that peak. Uh, and uh, of course, you want to make sure that the uh, that the uh, grounds 
are the same. If you look at both channel one and channel two, they're not quite the same, so you need to adjust that so that channel one and channel two have the same ground. You have the same reference for both channels. Okay, so we have a full wave, full wave rectified circuit on channel two. Now, the last thing we're going to do, I guess that's part four. We're going to take a 100 microfarad, and you know these are roughly 100 microfarad capacitors, plus or minus 20 percent, uh, because we haven't really calibrated this one, and we're going to hook it in parallel with the resistor. So best to shut things off when you're doing some wiring. And again, the banded end is the shorter lead, uh, and the banded end is the shorter lead, so that's the one that points towards the black uh, connections, the ground connections. Uh, by the way, this ground connection really isn't needed because they're both grounded in the chassis of the oscilloscope, but just to keep it out of the way, I've connected them. So I'm going to put this in parallel with uh, the resistor. So now it's in parallel with the resistor and we have actually we have an RC circuit and you know all about RC circuits. There's a time constant involved called RC, R times C. So we have a 10,000 ohm resistor uh, and you, you're welcome to check it for its value but it's close to 10,000 and we're not going to check the capacitor. That requires a whole experiment as you well know. Uh, and so uh, we're going to assume that's 100 100 microfarad, so 10,000, 10, 10 to the fourth times 100 micro, which is 10 to the minus four, is one second. So the time constant is one second. And we talked about that earlier, so that the time distance between each pulse is 120th of a second. And uh, if we look at channel two now, which we're looking at, we see not the scalloped uh, sine waves flipped over, but we see a, a, a line that's a little bit on the nervous side. So it's wiggling a little bit. And of course, that's called ripple. And that's what we're looking for. So uh, there's a neat way to measure the ripple. First of all, we see that this is almost a steady DC voltage. If we do, uh, if I flip our channel two to ground and flip it up here, we see that that's almost exactly 23 volts again. And so we have a basically made here a 23 volt power supply. And now you might want a 19, a nine volt power supply or a five volt power supply for your electronic gadgets uh, you, that you have. And so you would then start with a transformer that produces five volts or nine volts peak value, uh, 10 volts or 18 volts peak to peak value. And then you can reduce it down by couple diodes, a resistor, and a capacitor to smooth out the, the, the signal. So uh, our quest, our final quest is to figure out, well, how big is that ripple? Well, that's on channel two. So let's look over, look over at channel two. If we, as again, if we flip it from DC to AC, that puts a capacitor in between the lead and the magnetic deflectors. Uh, and we can then uh, simply, then we basically, basically we've, with the capacitor charged up to 23 volts, we've, we're looking only at the leftover, so to speak, AC signal. So let me move that uh, to the middle here, and then because uh, it's so small, I can turn it up farther and farther and farther until it's very large. If I put the trigger to, on channel two, it's a little more stable, uh, and I see there. If you fiddle with your trigger level, you get it just just nicely. It's, again, it's moving up down a little bit because the voltage is fluctuating just a little bit. We're looking at the top of the iceberg here. We're looking at just a little bitty fraction of 1% of the top of those 23 volt peaks. And so it's a little bit nervous for that reason. You also notice that these peaks are not the same size. And that gets back to the fact that the, the original 22 volt high peaks were not exactly the same size, which means the center tap was not exactly in the center. Really, really close, but not exactly in the center. So uh, you, um, you might want to average these two peaks. 
or you might want to read just the, the, the worst peak to give you your percent error. So we can kick it up one more. Uh, it's a little bit hard to uh, stop. Maybe there we go. And again, it's never going to, it's going to bounce worse the, the more gain you have on the uh, vertical scale. Uh, and so we can just, let me just move that down so that it's kind of on the average on this line here. And then we'll look up here. And if you want to move that over to measure the, so this is, I'm assuming this is on the average at that line. I'm going to move this over here, and I'm going to measure this uh, as approximately, let's see, one, two, three, we'll say three and a half, 3.5 centimeters on the 50 millivolt per centimeter scale. So 3.5 times 0 0.050 is uh, a pretty small number, uh, the um, uh, 0.0175, and that's the ripple factor. Ripple factor is that voltage divided by the 23 volts, whatever you measure as the peak value, uh, and that's pretty small. It'd be something like 0 0.01 or something like that. Anyway, so this is within 1% of a nicely uh, filtered uh, uh, 23 volt DC signal. We're looking at the very top of the iceberg here on this signal. So, uh, and again, these are not quite the same because it's not the center taps, not in the center. Uh, that's going to contribute to a little larger ripple factor than the theoretical ripple factor, uh, which you have the formula for. So compare your actual ripple factor to your theoretical ripple factor, and I'm sure you can explain why one's bigger than the other. Okay, that's the experiment.